In this final video, looking at the contents of a contract, we're going to start by looking at implied terms and the various different ways in which a term can be implied into a contractual agreement. And then lastly, we're going to look at the nature of terms themselves. So at that point, we're collecting together all of the express and implied terms of the contract, and then we will seek to categorize them into conditions of contract, which are the most important type of term, into warranties, and then finally into anonymous terms, where you have to look at the outcome of breaching that term to be able to classify it. So that's what we mean by the nature of terms. And this will be our final video focusing on the contents of a contract. So just by way of a brief introduction before we begin, I think it's important to really sit back and understand what an implied term is and why we have them in the first place. Because there's good means to say that if the parties haven't agreed it expressly, then there should be no implied terms. But that is not the case for the reasons we will soon see. So first of all, you have to consider what a contract is, you know, stripping it back to bare bones. It's not an isolated act but an incident in the conduct of business. And I like that little turn of phrase to try and describe it. So you contract for a specific purpose. So if I go to Starbucks to purchase a coffee, I'm going to purchase that coffee to consume it. So there has to be an implied term there that it will be fit for that purpose, that it will be of satisfactory quality, that it will be as described and so on. So by looking at the background context in which the contract arises, you can start to see why it is important to have implied terms if the parties feel to agree terms expressly. Another very important aspect to remember is that implied terms are just as important as expressed terms. If a term is implied into an agreement by fact or by statute or by custom, those different mechanisms that we will look at a little bit later on, it applies just to the same level as an express term. If you breach it, there will be damages or potentially grounds to repudiate the contract if that implied term is a really important one, if it's a condition of the agreement, and the same applies to express terms in the exact same way. And then finally, how do the courts actually read implied terms if there is nothing there? Well, what they do is they read them in to the agreement and they read in the implied terms as if they were agreed expressly up front. And they will read the contract in this hypothetical way as if the implied term was there from the beginning. So that's what we mean by implied terms being read in to an agreement. So breaking all of this down and, and looking at it with a bit of perspective, there are three primary ways in which a term can be implied into a contractual agreement. And those are terms implied by fact, by law or by custom. When we talk about terms being implied by fact, you think about two different parties about to enter into a contract. So on the factual circumstances, and when we look at the officious bystander test, would the reasonable observer watching the parties about to enter into that agreement, would they have thought they would have included the term had they remembered about it? Would that reasonable person, that officious bystander have said, oh yes, of course they would have remembered about it. That's the officious bystander test. And if that test is satisfied, the term is implied by fact. On a similar level, we've got the business efficacy test, and that is when a term is required to actually make the contract make sense. That when you contract with the party to offload something onto your dock, that the ship will not be damaged whenever the low tide comes in. And that's the case of the Murcock, which is the leading case on that particular point. And we'll examine that in a bit of detail. We will then look briefly at the Seal of Goods Act and the Seal of Goods and Services Act to look at the terms that are implied by law and by statute. And then lastly, rather briefly, we will look at terms implied by custom because that is the slightly more unusual of the circumstances in which a term will be implied into a contract. So looking then at terms implied by fact, first of all, these simply mean terms that reflect the unexpressed intention of the parties. So if it was brought to their attention and they had remembered about it, they would have signed up to it. That is what we mean by a term implied by fact. The test that we use for that, first of all, is the officious bystander test. And in the Court of Appeal decision in Sherlaw and Southern Foundries, the Court of Appeal described it as follows. 
if a officious bystander was with the parties, and that term just means the reasonable person effectively, you know, knowing all of the circumstances. If that individual was with the parties at the time they were about to enter into the contract, and that individual reminded them of this term that they had forgotten about, and they would respond to that and say, of course we're going to add that into the contract. That is the officious bystander test. And that is exactly how it was described in that case of Sherlaw and Southern Foundries. So it's a term that could be left out by mistake, or it could be so obvious that it goes without saying. But if that officious bystander was to remind them, then the parties would have no problem adding it in. And that's the test that the courts will use in determining if a term has been implied by fact. What the courts can also do, however, is actually imply a term to make the contract work, to give it business efficacy. And that is where the term comes from. And the leading case that we have on that particular one is the Moorcock. And we're going to consider its facts in the next slide. Looking then at the rather interesting case of the Moorcock from 1889. So this case is all to do with the offloading of cargo from a ship and that ship is the Murrakok, hence the name. So the defendant in this case were the wharfingers. They were the people that owned the wharf and they were contracted by the owners of the Murrakok to offload the cargo from that ship. So as part of that agreement, everybody knew exactly what was going to happen. Everybody knew at low tide, the Murrakok would rest on the riverbed. This wharf was located in a part of the Thames that at low tide was exposed to mud flats effectively. It was at a very low area of the Thames. And everybody knew that, everybody accepted it, and everybody proceeded on that basis. So you can probably imagine what happened here. When it came to the Murcock resting on the riverbed, it was damaged. The ground was uneven, there were rocks, and the boat and the ship itself was damaged, unfortunately. And the owners of the Murcock sued the defendant. They sued the wharfingers, the owner of that wharf, for breach of contract. The natural defence that was raised was breach of what term? We didn't expressly agree that the riverbed was safe for your ship to lay on at low tide. But the court had absolutely no problem implying such a term into the agreement on the basis that everybody knew exactly what would happen. Everybody knew the ship was going to rest on the riverbed at low tide. And why else would the owners of the Murcock have entered into the contract if they didn't think the ship would be safe? So the court implied a term into that agreement that the vessel could safely lay on the riverbed at low tide. They implied that term into the agreement to give it business efficacy. If they hadn't implied that term, the contract would have made no sense because the contract itself was for the offloading of the cargo and how else could cargo have been offloaded if there was not an implied term there that the ship would be safe in doing so. So that is an example of when the courts will imply a term to give a contract business efficacy. Moving on then to look at terms implied by law. So on this slide, we're going to consider some of the key terms that are implied by the Seal of Goods Act 1979 and the Seal of Goods and Services Act 1982. So before we begin, depending on the type of contract that you are talking about, there may be many other terms implied into that. So for example, I am a construction lawyer. I work in construction contracts day and daily. There is a whole plethora of terms that would be implied into that sort of agreement if they are not agreed expressly. The right to adjudicate, the right to interim payment, the right to suspend work for non-payment, to name but a few. So that's the first thing you have to remember here, that terms implied by law will vary dramatically depending on the type of contractual agreement that you are dealing with. On this particular slide, we're only really dealing with contracts which are to do with the sale of goods and services. So starting then with goods, and that's all under the Seal of Goods Act 1979. These are the five key implied terms that will be brought in to a contract for the sale of goods. If you haven't agreed them expressly, they will be implied in via this statute. So first of all, we've got the implied term that the seller of goods 
actually has legal title to sell those goods. That's what we mean by the term under section 11, subsection one. The next three people would be usually familiar with that there's an implied term that the seal, if it's done by description, that the goods will match that description. So when you go into Tesco's and you purchase something and you read, you know, the nutritional value, for example, that those goods will conform with that description. And I think you can see the utility in having such an implied term under English law that the goods will be of satisfactory quality and that the goods will be fit for their intended purpose as well are usually the three things that people often hear about and the ones that people are most familiar with. The final implied term under section 15.2, however, is one that is not so you know, common or prevalent. And that is the implied term that if a seal is concluded by way of a sample, so if you are given a sample of you know, a type of material, for example, and you then enter into a bigger transaction on the basis that all of the other goods are representative of the sample, then there's an implied term that they will conform with that sample. If you've got a nice silky smooth sample of fabric and you enter into a big contract on the foot of that, that bulk has to conform with the sample. And that's the implied term under section 15.2. In terms of those um, terms and what they actually amount to, there's a little bit more reading to be done on that. And I've referred you and signposted you to that here. And that's the fact that all of these implied terms are conditions of contract. They are important terms of the agreement. We will look at what a condition of contract is shortly. But for now, a condition is the most important type of contract term to be contrasted with a mere warranty. And we will look at the difference between those two terms a little bit later on in this video. But there's a little bit more to do after that. So once you have identified the implied term, so one of the five things you can see on screen, and you have found the relevant subsection that categorizes it, so into conditions in this regard, there is then an additional bonus question that you have to ask yourself under section 15A bracket one. So the point is, and what we're looking at here, if one of these implied terms is breached, it's a breach of a condition. And something that we will cover later on is the remedies that are available for breaching a condition of contract. And the key remedy that you can get, or that additional remedy that you can get for breaching a condition is the right to repudiate the contract, the right of rejection when we're talking about goods here. And that's when section 15A comes in. You have to first ask yourself the question before you ever return the goods, you have to ask yourself that question. Was the breach so slight that it would be unreasonable for you to reject the goods? So once you've asked yourself that question, you then can determine the answer and the remedy that is available under the Seal of Goods Act. So if the answer to that question is yes, that the damage is very slight, that it would be unreasonable to return the goods, then despite the fact it is a condition, the only remedy available is damages or a refund usually when you're talking about the Seal of Goods. But if the answer to that question is no, and the breach is not slight, and it would be reasonable to return the goods, then you also have the right of rejection under section 15A of the Seal of Goods Act. So that's what we mean by asking yourselves that question under section 15A. By answering it, you ultimately direct yourself towards the remedy. And then moving on to the Seal of Goods and Services Act, and it primarily deals with services. And that's when we really start to get interested in that particular act. And it's all about section 13. That when a consultant or someone providing professional services, so your plumber, your electrician, for example, or as I say, a professional consultant, so someone providing you know, design services, you know, I deal in construction, I would see that day and daily, that they are required as an implied term at law to carry out those services with reasonable skill and care. And that's very similar to the duty of care that they would otherwise owe in tort as well. And that's what we call the concurrent liability of a consultant, that they would often owe a duty in contract 
perhaps via the implied term section 13, to carry out the services using reasonable skill and care, but they also owe a duty in tort not to be negligent, to carry out their services, again, using the reasonable care and skill of a suitably qualified professional. Moving on then to the third and final way in which terms can be implied into an agreement, and that is via custom. So before we begin on this one, please bear in mind that this one is very strange and very uncommon and very unlikely to ever arise, practically speaking, or day to day, but we cover it nonetheless. So this circumstance will arise and terms will be implied whenever there is evidence to prove that under a local custom, those terms would be in the contractual agreement. So if you're dealing in a certain custom where they always deal with contracts that have those terms, then there might be the opportunity to imply them into the agreement. So that's what we mean here. And that's exemplified with the case of Smith and Wilson. Again, a very old case, very bizarre set of facts, again, strange to be quite honest, that the claimant in this case had contracted, or so they thought, to leave behind 10,000 rabbit skins. And the point was, the local custom in that area of England, which was Suffolk, believe it or not, was that when you're talking about rabbit skins and you use the word 1,000, you actually mean 100 dozen. Again, you heard that correctly. There was a local custom in Suffolk that when you use the word 1,000, you actually meant 100 dozen. So on this particular set of facts, an individual was required to leave behind 10,000 rabbit skins. They read that literally, and they thought it was 10, 0, 0, 0, as a normal person would. But under the custom in which they entered into that agreement, that word 1,000, as I said, actually meant 100 dozen. So they were required to leave 1,000 dozen or 12,000 rabbits. And ultimately, they were liable for that because of the implied term that that word had a specific meaning on that specific custom. So now then that we have covered implied terms, we're going to move on to a completely separate topic, and that is the nature of contract terms. So have a cognitive break here. Everything that we've discussed up to this point is an entirely separate topic, and we're now about to move on to something fresh. So at this point, we have now collected together all of our express terms, which we covered in the previous video, you know, bringing those pre-contractual statements in and making them express terms and all of the rules that go with that. And we've collected together all of our implied terms. So by fact, by law, or perhaps by custom, and we've got them all together. And now the job of the lawyer is to classify them because not all contract terms are created equally. Some are more important than others. Some are conditions of contract, the most important, and some are mere warranties. And it's important to classify those two different types of term because if you end up breaching them, the remedies available are very different depending on whether or not it is a condition or a warranty. So that's what we mean by the nature of terms. So looking then at the nature of terms, as we said, this is all about classifying terms into one of the three categories that you can see on screen. So all terms of a contract can be classified into one of these three groups. And what we're about to explore is the rules that surround that classification. When a term will be a condition, when a term will be a warranty, and then we will look at the anonymous term approach as well. So the point is, it's all about the relative importance of the contract term. Conditions are the most important. They are the terms that go to the root of the agreement. That is what the parties contracted for. And if that term is breached, it gives rise to very draconian consequences. The right to repudiate the contract, to treat it as at an end, and then to seek damages. Compared to the slightly lesser important term of a contract, only being a warranty, which would only entitle the innocent party to damages. There's no right to elect that the contract is at an end to repudiate the agreement. So that's what we're talking about here. And that is ultimately our focus over the next couple of slides to classify those terms into one of those three groups.
So just in terms of a bit of perspective, as we say, we're going to look at the three different groups that you can see on screen. And thankfully for you, the case law in this area is quite straightforward. And the difference between a condition and a warranty, in my mind, is very well illustrated by looking at the two cases of Poissard and Spears, all to do with an opera singer, and the case of Bettini and Guy, which again was to do with a theatrical performance. So two very similar cases on their facts, two very similar breaches, but with two very different outcomes, depending on the nature of the term that was breached. In Poissard and Spears, the term was a condition of contract entitling the innocent party to end the contract, to repudiate it and to seek damages. And in Bettini and Guy, it was merely a warranty and they did not have the ability to repudiate the contract, but they did it anyway. And that's where that case went wrong for them. And then finally, we look at the slightly different topic and the slightly different category of anonymous terms. So this one tends to throw people. So I'm going to go over that one in quite a bit of depth. Think of anonymous terms in that third category on screen as more of an approach to looking at something. It's not necessarily a category. It's more of an approach. So I would call that one the anonymous term approach. And it works on the basis that a term isn't actually that clear whether or not it's a condition or a warranty. And what you have to do in that circumstance is look what would happen if that term was breached and ask yourself the question, would the breach deprive the innocent party of substantially the whole benefit of the contract? And that is the rather famous formulation from the case of Hong Kong for shipping and KKK. And we will look at that shortly. So the first category of contract term that we're going to consider are the conditions of contract or a term being a condition of contract. You will quite often see that turn of phrase used. You know, you talk about the terms and conditions. That's where the turn of phrase comes from or that's where it's colloquially used. But for us, the word condition has a very distinct legal meaning and it means a term of the contract that goes to the root of the agreement. It means the most important type of term that you can get. So when you see something being referred to as a condition, you need to spark up immediately and to focus in on it because if the parties have attached that word to it, it's, it's not necessarily conclusive evidence that it is a condition. You have to look at whether or not it actually does go to the root, but it will be a very strong indicator of such. And the case that we have for that, as I said at the beginning, is Poissard and Spears. And we're going to look at the facts of that when we contrast it a little bit later on with the facts of Bettini and Guy. But the key takeaway here is if you've identified a term of the contract that goes to the root of the agreement and thus you've categorised it as a condition, then you understand what happens if that term is breached. So if I breach a condition of contract or something that goes to the root of the agreement, that would entitle you, the innocent party, to repudiate the agreement, to treat the contract as at an end and to discharge the agreement. What you can also do then is seek repudiatory damages. So not only can you bring the contract to an end and discharge it, you can also seek damages. So that's the key thing that is available for breaching a condition both repudiation and or you don't have to repudiate. You've got a freedom of election. You can choose not to end the contract and you can also seek damages. So you can repudiate and seek damages or you can just seek damages and keep the contract in existence because the innocent party has that freedom of election. The topic of repudiation we cover in one of our later videos because it's a completely separate topic in its own right. And we will talk about that freedom of election a little bit later on. Moving on then to talk about warranties instead of conditions. So a warranty is a term of a contractual agreement with lesser significance, with lesser importance. It can be breached without such draconian outcomes. And quite simply, the definition of a warranty is something that is not a condition. So if it doesn't go to the root of the contract, if breaching it is not going to deprive the innocent party of any real benefit, of any substantial benefit, then the term will be classified as a warranty. And the point is, if a warranty is breached, there is no right to repudiate the contract. And this is where this can often be a problem. If two parties are in a contractual agreement 
and a minor term of that agreement is breached, so a warranty is breached. What the innocent party will sometimes do to try and escape liability, to try and get away from this agreement, is to repudiate it. Because you breached that minor little term, I'm just going to walk away from this agreement and I'm going to sue you for repudiation. But you can't do that. If the term that was breached is only a warranty, you cannot bring the contract to an end. Your only remedy, as what we have in the final bullet point there, is to claim damages for breach of that warranty. You cannot repudiate the contract. For warranties, you can only seek damages. So to compare and contrast the difference between a condition of contract, something that goes to the root of the agreement, something really important, and a mere warranty, on the other hand, something of lesser importance, we're going to look at the two leading cases on this, which are Poissard and Spears and Pond, and Bettini and Guy. Both of these cases are very similar in terms of their facts. Again, both a little bit bizarre, but they illustrate this point perfectly. So with respect to what amounts to a condition, we have Poissard and Spears and Pond. This case is all about Madame Poissard. She was an opera singer and she was contracted to perform in a series of operas over a four month period. But the problem was she became very ill just before the first performance and she couldn't perform. She missed the first performance. And as a result of that, Spears and Pond, who were the owners of the opera, terminated her contract. She then sued them and made a case that you could not terminate my agreement. Me missing the first performance was simply breaching a warranty and therefore you could not terminate. Because again, remember, you can only terminate or repudiate for breach of a condition. You do not have that right for breach of a mere warranty. So Madame Poissard's case was that her missing that one performance at the beginning was only a breach of a warranty. But the court applied the test that we learned a couple of slides previous. Did that term go to the root of the agreement? Did performing the opera as the lead singer go to the root of her contract? And of course, the answer to that was, yes, it did. Madame Poissard, you're an opera singer. Funnily enough, your role was to perform the lead role in that opera. And therefore, because you didn't perform it, they were entitled to terminate your contract. Because your obligation went to the root of that agreement, that's what they were paying you for, Madame Poissard. They were entitled to terminate it whenever you breached it by not turning up to perform. The fact that she was ill was neither here nor there back in 1876. Moving then to the case of Bettini and Guy and to contrast those facts and to distinguish it. This case was all about a singer who again was contracted to perform a series of operettas and he failed to turn up to a number of rehearsals. So that's the key difference here. In Poissard and Spears, Madame Poissard failed to turn up to the actual live performance. In Bettini and Guy, the singer failed to turn up to a couple of rehearsals. So you can see the difference here immediately. In Poissard and Spears, that failure to turn up was a, went to the root of the agreement. That is what the opera singer was contracted for. But in Bettini and Guy, it was only a rehearsal. It was only something ancillary to the primary purpose, which was ultimately the live performances. So what happened in Bettini and Guy? He failed to turn up to a couple of the rehearsals and the contract was terminated. The singer sued the operetta company Guy and he was successful. He was successful because they had no right to terminate the agreement. They had no right to terminate the agreement because the failure to turn up to a couple of rehearsals was only a breach of a warranty. It did not go to the root of the agreement. So in both of these cases, the runners or the operators of the operas terminated the agreements. In Poissard and Spears, that was perfectly lawful because the breach went to the root of the contract. It breached the condition. But in Bettini and Guy, it was not because the breach was only of a warranty, something of lesser importance, something that was not at the heart or the root of the contract. So moving on then to talk about our third and final category of contract term, and that is the anonymous terms, the dreaded anonymous terms, because every law student always gets hung up on this one. So I'll try to explain it as best I can. So an anonymous term, first of all, the word anonymous simply means you can't categorize it. It doesn't have a name, anonymous, no name. 
and realistically it's a type of term that falls somewhere in between a condition and a warranty. There's a sort of no man's land in between and that no man's land is occupied by our friends the anonymous terms. So what the court in and the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong for Shipping held and what they decided was that there are certain types of term that you cannot classify as a condition or a warranty. You cannot classify them because you first have to look at what the outcome of the breach is. You have to apply a wait and see approach before you can understand what the innocent party is entitled to. And there's a, there's a lot of cases on this. They're all very complicated. So I think actually just looking at Hong Kong fur shipping is probably the easiest inroad into this. So that case and the term of the contract in that case was what's known as a sea worthiness clause. And it set out effectively that the ship in question would be in every way fitted for cargo service. So that was the term here that the court had to classify. But let's think about that because there's a number of ways in which that term could be breached and the outcomes are dramatically different. So what happens if the engines do not work? So if the engines do not work, it breaches that clause because it's not seaworthy, because it can't get from port to port. And would that deprive the innocent party of substantially the whole benefit of the contract? Absolutely it would. So that type of breach would ultimately result in a remedy for the innocent party, whereby they could terminate the contract or repudiate the agreement and or seek damages because it went to the root of the contract. It deprived them of substantially the entire benefit of the agreement. But that same seaworthiness clause can also be breached in a slightly different way and a plethora of different ways. What, for example, if one of the rivets popped on the hull and started to let in a little bit of water, not enough to sink the thing, but enough to be inconvenient that you had to bail it out or pitch it out every now and again. You had to have a pump, you know, constantly working. Would that deprive the innocent party of substantially the whole benefit? Probably not, because the ship can still get from port to port, but you just have to have this additional pump going 24 seven. It doesn't deprive the innocent party of substantially the whole benefit. So by looking at that or looking at the outcome of that specific breach, it is more like a warranty. It is more like breaching a term of lesser significance. So in that circumstance, the innocent party would only be entitled to damages. If they were to try and repudiate the contract because one rivet on this massive tanker had popped, again, which would be a very common thing to happen, then that would be a wrongful termination. And that's where this can ultimately become a contentious issue because the parties don't necessarily know what camp the term will fall into. So that's when you have to be very careful when you're deciding to repudiate a contract, that you have to make sure that the breach was actually repudiatory in nature, that it went to the root of the contract, that it deprived the innocent party of substantially the entire benefit, and therefore you actually have grounds to repudiate. Otherwise, you might fall foul of that, and that would give rise to a wrongful termination in which the innocent party could actually be held liable for wrongful termination and all the damages that go with that. So I hope that's a decent enough explanation of what an anonymous term is. My biggest piece of advice is to think of the seaworthiness clause in Hong Kong fur shipping and the fact that depending on how you breach that clause will dictate which camp it falls into and will ultimately dictate the remedy available to the innocent party.